continue with the Buddha, huh? If one does not practice any of these token renunciations of the body on the causal level, then even if one realizes the unconditioned, one will still have to come back as a person to repay one's past debts, exactly as I had to undergo the retribution of having to eat the grain meant for horses. The Buddha had to one time eat the grain that meant for horses or other food meant for horses for three months. Probably because he has a little bit of debt he did not pay. But if he had burned, probably burned the incense on his body, then he has paid the debt. Then he didn't have to do that. You see, Buddha very compassionately explained all this, and he even confessed his own debt at his own expense, not wanting the disciple to, uh, to, to how say, worship him as a perfect, flawless, enlightened being, but still has some debt to pay from the past life. But this is a Maya arrangement that way, so that the Buddha had to have some debt. Otherwise, how can a Buddha ever had any debt? He's been a Buddha for, ay, you cannot even count how many Ian or Kaupas already passed. He even confessed that. He has mentioned that if you burn a candle or incense or finger, or one incense stick, even one incense stick on their bodies anywhere, you know, he didn't say on the head, but on their bodies, and then will in that moment repay their debts from beginningless of time. That's why I became a monk, in case I have debt, a lot of debt before. So I guess I'm free of debts now, and all the karma is yours. <laughs> yeah. Yours karma on me, because I have burned the incense, not just one incense, but three. The Buddha said here, that means I don't have karma. <laughs> Actually, before that, before I became official monk, I was in some ashram, yeah, you know, walking, going from one ashram to another, looking for masters. And several people always look at me and say, oh, you don't have any karma. Look at my hand, or look at my face. Say, oh, you have a bodhisattva eyebrow. I don't know what bodhisattva eyebrow look like, but, <laughs> but I did have it according to them. And look at my arm and my hands. Oh, you have no karma. Not at all. That was before I became a monk. Okay? Yes. And then I became Tibetan monk. And I became Hindu monk. And then finally I became Buddhist monk. I try all traditions. So if I wasn't clean by the Tibetan monk uh, married, then I was clean by the Hindu monks married. If not, then I triple it by become Buddhist monk. So actually, I was free of karma. So whatever happened to me is all your fault. Your fault. <laughs> Love you, karma. Yes. <laughs> it's nice to blame somebody else. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> the most easy way, <laughs> you know, is to blame everybody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I do the same. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> okay, now... When, the Buddha continued, when you teach people in the world to cultivate somebody, they must also cease stealing. This is the third clear and unalterable instruction on purity given by the first come one and the Buddhas of the past and the war honor one in ones in the past. I mean, many Buddha, one Buddha after another, all the Buddhas teaching this way, all the saints. All the thirst come ones teach this way. The precept is important. That's why even if you become a monk or nun, even you burn incense, or that, you still need to take precept. You take the precept so that you always go straight, you know? I give you only five precepts, and you complain, and sometimes you don't keep some of it. If you become a monk, 200-something precepts, Monks and nuns, similar, understand me, in the Buddhist tradition. I don't want to tell you this, because if you know it, you have to keep it. Because you're lay people, so I cannot tell you. You understand me? Yeah. All kind of precepts you have to keep, not just five precepts. But these five precepts, even as Buddha mentioned here, are the main one. 
okay? Because if you don't keep your mind pure from uh, lust, other precepts also will be kind of depleting and, how you say, uh, lacking, okay? For example, if you're lusting after a woman and maybe she's already married or she's unattainable, and then, I don't mean you, but I mean some people who lacking of moral standard or lacking of self-control might try to find a way to harm anyone that gets into his way to, to, to possess that woman of his desire. And then other precepts can also be broken. Therefore, the five precepts are the, the mother of other precepts, okay? Right. Keep them, keep them. Keep them with your life, okay? It's not just a written words. It is your life. It's your guaranteed shine for happiness ever after. Even if you stray from my teaching, keep the five precepts, okay? Because if you don't, you will be very terribly regret when you go to hell and undergoing all kind of payback uh, punishment. Okay, huh? I don't want that to happen to any of you or anybody at all. But you already been taught right from wrong, so you do keep it, huh? It's not that difficult. Five precepts is a very simple uh, rule which should not be even a precept. It should be like a standard living way of a human, a decent human, not to talk about a saint or practitioner or anything like that. Keep them. Hmm? In uh, Catholicism or Hinduism or Jainism, they all keep precepts. They all have this kind of basic ahimsa, no harming to others, yes? And stealing is also harming others in a different way, yeah? Because if you steal somebody money or something that he or she needs, then you discomfort that person. You make her and him, or hers or his life, not smooth. And then you make her, him worry and then distracting him or her from their daily routine or efficiency to their work, whatever they're doing. So when you do something, think twice, okay, before you do it. That's all very simple. Whatever not yours, even if worthless, don't take. Very simple, okay? Is that difficult? No. Been told decades already, huh? The Buddha tell Ananda that when you teach people, in the world to cultivate somebody. Remember, because Ananda asked the Buddha, how in the future can I help all the beings, even though I myself are not very highly developed, I'm not, maybe not saved yet, but I want to save others. <laughs> I want to try. So the Buddha teach him all this, yeah? So he continued to say, when you teach people in the world to cultivate somebody, meaning after Buddha is gone, nobody there, then if you want to teach others and teach them all this, all the above mentioned, uh, you know, regulation, precept, principle, okay? And plus, if they want to cultivate samadhi, they must also cease stealing, yeah? Don't steal anything. This is the third clear and unalterable, uncompromisable. That is the real truth. Nothing can replace it. No killing no unethical sexual relationship, okay? No stealing. Even if you're married, you have to, I said, taper off. The master in India, even they are married. Many of them do. Yeah. Because they're married already <laughs> before they became a master. Or even afterward. But they have copper interaction only try three times a year just to make children, to do the tradition, family, that's all. Not because they, they're lustful after that, just kind of duty. So this is unalterable rules of the universe that you must keep in order to be liberated, with or without the Buddha presence. Now, 
Therefore, Ananda, if cultivators of Chan Samadhi, in meditators, uh -huh, do not cease stealing, they are like someone who pours water into a leaking cup and hopes to fill it. I mean, useless. Huh? You waste your time. If you pour water into a leaking cup, will the water stay inside? No. So if you don't keep these basic precepts, then no matter how long you meditate, it just keeps leaking out, gone, 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 to the maya power. The maya will take it and use it to harm you and harm others as well. He may continue for as many aeons as there are fine motes of dust, but it still will not be full in the end. It's like that. If you don't keep the precept, forget your samadhi, forget your meditation. Useless to you. That's what the Buddha would say. All right, I say the same. In Thailand, there was one sister. She heard several disciples during meditation seeing the vision that I was the King Rama V of Thailand. It's not my fault if they saw I was King Rama of Thailand. Understand me? <laughs> Even if I was, <laughs> huh? then she criticized me. Uh, she said that according to her, any decent man will marry only one wife. Uh, the King Rama maybe have more than one wife. I can't remember. The, maybe I'm not King Rama. I don't remember how many wives I had. <laughs> if I did, so what? Okay? So I told her, even if King Rama or I married hundred times or to hundred women, hundred men, I am still enlightened, and I am still in focus of enlightenment, and I am still in heaven. Even Master had to pay some debt, okay? Not, maybe not for the Master her himself, but for the disciples, okay? That's number one, okay? Like the Buddha has to eat the horse uh, food, okay? Actually, in some other karma, in some other sutra, they say because of disciples' fault. Disciple karma that he had to do that. And no matter what, okay? There's a master business. Huh? Your business is just to take your precept, keep it, meditate, and be good, okay? Now, for the poor King Rama of Thailand, he was very famous, very beloved by his people, and he did a lot of good things for Thailand. Very beloved king. And any king who married once or twice or third times, it is tradition, it is obligation. Because in the old time, that is the king, you know, they have to marry and have a lot of princes and princesses so they can fill the post here and there, married to the neighboring countries, girls, uh, princess or prince, to tighten the friendship, coalition with neighbors. That's how they do it, okay? Not necessarily that the king likes it. And you don't know what the king's uh, 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 heart problem. He may have many wives or concubines, but it works like this. Every night he had to pick up uh, from the unknown, how you say, cart, okay? Like, for example, I have two, three, four cards here, okay? A hundred card, whatever. The name is written here, upside down. So I don't see what card, what name of the concubine is coming tonight. I just pick any. Oh, Elizabeth. Ah, okay. <laughs> and then the eunuch will bring Elizabeth to me, all wrapped in blanket, ready for business. Understand that? Okay. So the king don't even have any emotion involved in hundreds or how many hundreds of concubines. Just a job, just a work. Whether or not he likes that Elizabeth or not like Elizabeth. Fancy sleeping with somebody you don't like. Every night you have to do it. You don't even know her. You don't even know him. Fancy, huh? You like that? No. no. Even if you like women, you can't just like that all the time, right? It's like a job. And woe to any king who favor just one concubine. Then sooner or later his kingdom fall. 
You can see that in history. I don't know if your history, but China, for example. Like the Tang, the king of Tang, Ming Huang, he fancy one concubine. He loves only one. And later they hate her. They kill her. And they kill him too. His kingdom gone because of one beauty. Similar everywhere. One time in Vietnam, one king, he loves one of his queens very much. But he, he has to kill her because it disturbed him too much for his state affair. One, one time he sent her with a letter, seal, with the king's seal, and she cannot open, she doesn't know what is inside. Nobody allowed to. He sent her to go to one of his generals with the letter. Inside he said, please kill her so that I will have peace of mind to take care of the country's business. He can't allow himself to be too much entangled in this emotional so-called love affair, even though he's entitled to it. Now, this is very sad, but being a king is not that easy, okay? There's other king also, if he favor one concubine, he's not allowed to. Even if he allow himself to do that, the whole court, royal court, or his mother, his advisor, they won't fancy that, they won't allow that. Sooner or later, he has to give her up, or the kingdom will fall, because they will not support him. Because other ministers don't support him. Other, other family, powerful family in the country, who offer their daughters to the king will not support him. Do you understand? Yes. Because their daughters are neglected. And the king will not fair to all of them and fancy only one. Then all the people will slowly fall off their favor. And then the king is alone. And with the queen who has been envied, jealous, hated, want to destroy. And then sooner or later it fell. Many times in the history of China, especially like that, you read them, okay? And you know. So to criticize a king of having many wives is not fair anyway, okay? Whether or not I was King Rama or the King Rama have many wives or not, I, who cares? You have to see more, bigger picture. You can't just point your nose into the toilet alone in the house and say, oh, this place stinks. The toilet stinks, but not the whole place. The king, he has duty to his nation. He does everything or did what he can in order to uphold his country, to develop peace with all the neighbors. In order to do that, he had to marry his prince and princess to different countries' royalty. That was in the before. That's how they make peace and, I say, um, coalition together to keep themselves strong. Therefore, he, he doesn't even know who's going to sleep with him tonight. <laughs> it's just a card, you know? They give you every night a card. You just pick up one, and whoever comes will come. There's no, like, okay, every night romantic and stuff like that. It's not. I mean, and if you want to have a romantic one like that, then you do sooner or later. It's like that. Because these ministers of the king, they love to give their daughter to be the king's favorite and concubine, strengthen also their power, prestige, the whole family, like that. Even then, no, no benefit, but, oh, the wife of the king, my daughter. Of course, any father wants that, any, any mother loves that. And therefore, the king was offered many from the minister or sub-ministers or the generals or the, uh, whatever you name it, yeah? They all have, if they have daughter, they offer to the king. And the king have to accept it so that they will be loyal to him, support him, yeah? Make him strong and the country stable. If the king alone, how can he, how can he do anything, yeah? Even though he's so-called supposed to be the most powerful, but he doesn't 
have anybody support him. The general don't want to protect him. The minister don't want to help him. The uh, ambassadors don't want to make relationship better with the other country. How the kings are going to go on anything? In the old time, relying on that. You see, nowadays we have many, many more better uh, communication system. Yeah. We can go directly to another country. Being a king, you can go directly or minister or prime minister. You can go and shake hands with a neighbor country quickly. In the, in the old time, you have to rely on all these supports around you. Hmm? All support you get. Therefore, he has to have many wives. And he has to be fair to all of them. And that is the rule. He cannot pick one or two or three, just have to treat all of them. Every night he has to sleep with one different woman and they take turn, you know? If they have hundred, then he has to keep every night one until the hundred's done and then return. He cannot have one wife, two nights, three nights. Just one, he likes it or not like it, it's like that. Even in China history, one king, he cannot have children. It's just like some men don't have children somehow, you know? Maybe their destiny, maybe they are not potent. So that king has no children at all with all his queens and, you know, second queens, third queens, concubines. No one bear him any child. He is impotent. So what they do? Every night or every now and then they make a party in the in the in the palace uh, secret uh, chamber somewhere and they let the young young handsome able you know potent men go into there and have party with the concubines and then all the children are born from there become prince and princess and also marry off outside as the royal members so the king still can you know uh, strengthen his relationship with neighborhood country, even though he himself has no children, he does that. Very good. You see, so the king has, cannot even afford jealousy, not possessiveness of any concubine, even though if he is important, he cannot even afford to feel bad and then don't let other men come in and sleep with his so-called wives. He does that for the country. That is the man. No matter how many wives he has, is a good king. You capish now? Yes. You have to have wisdom, fairness, and IQ. Okay? Not just judging a little petty here, petty there, but it's no good. Okay? It's a little mundane, but uh, you should know a little bit. Okay? Being a king, you know, it's not that easy. Nowadays, king doesn't have to have many wives anymore. But even then, I remember some decades ago, one queen of a country cannot bear children and the king has to abdicate her. And she has to be dismissed because she couldn't bear children. King has to have children to continue the royal lineage. is an obligation. Obligation. So some nowadays, even the prince is married to some, uh, some lady, even royalty or not, she has to bear children, and right away, <laughs> almost right away after wedding. Before that, they can be boyfriend, girlfriend for years, but have nothing. After marriage, immediately have children. You can see that, you know that.